A few years ago, uh, crypto assets and cryptocurrencies were, were in a way put as an alternative to, tro to, to fiat money. I think that battle has been won. Uh, technology doesn't make for trusted money. And a point that I think is not being talked enough about is that using psychological pressure to change people's behaviours without their knowledge, not only did all the harm that everyone is discussing, suicide rates, mental health problems, couldn't see loved ones dying, but it also invalidated everyone's ability to give consent to the COVID jab. Because when you start to look at some of the government documents, um, for example, on, on the government document, I've got it here, it says consent must be obtained before starting any treatment. And it goes on to state that this includes the administration of all vaccines. And then when you look at Public Health England's Green Book of Immunisation, it, it says for consent to immunisation to be valid, it must be given freely, voluntarily and without coercion. And so then you've got to look at the definition of coercion. And the Encyclopaedia Britannica states it's the threat or use of punitive measures against states, groups or individuals in order to, for them to undertake or desist from specified actions. And then it goes on to state, and those threats include psychological pressure and social ostracism. And I think this is really important because the, the WhatsApp messages combined with the Spy V document prove that the psychological pressure was applied to the public. And that means any consent to immunisation that was given, whether they asked you or didn't, if you agreed or didn't agree, but even if you agreed, it was not valid. So to me, one of the most important questions that is going to emerge from this WhatsApp um, issue is going to be one of accountability and liability for all the people who have been greatly injured or been left bereft because, because of the COVID vaccine, because they gave their consent for an injection um, that they couldn't give consent to. So there has to be some form of, I think, uh, accountability based on the fact that no one could give informed consent. Uh, international at international level. And the idea that the WHO should have control over individuals' personal medical choices is an egregious abuse of power. This WHO pandemic treaty represents a further descent into the world of centralised powers that our leaders, our representatives in this place are failing to prevent. And you'll all understand in due course, I assure you of that. Our government departments are walking lockstep with a globalist agenda of the WH, WEF, the UN and the WHO, and we're ceding our national sovereignty bit by bit, death by a thousand cuts. There's a lot to discuss the proposed treaty, but if you choose just one example, Article 17 deals with the strengthening pandemic and public health literacy, and it reads, quote, the WHO will conduct regular social listening and analysis to identify the prevalence and profiles of misinformation, which contribute to the design communications and messaging of strategies for the public to counter misinformation and what else? Disinformation. What's the difference? We'll never know. Uh, th this is what the document says. Presumably the WHO will define what is deemed to be misinformation and presu presumably disinformation at some time and then we'll all knew and even uses the term false news. I'm sure this would be very convenient for the financial contributors to the WHO uh, that are heavily invested in the development and manufacturing of vaccines. And as I stated earlier, much if not all of what the WHO considered misinformation ultimately was, guess what? True. Turned out to be true. How about that? Why then would the Australian government entertain a treaty which allows the WHO to define what constitutes misinformation and uh, under the guise of international law and presumably work with social media companies to further censor the people of Australia and those that take a stand? I mean, that's what design communications and messaging strategy really means, ultimately. Essentially, the Australian government's lining up to sign an agreement that the WHO is the central body determining how once sovereign nations prepare for and deal with pandemics. We don't need international solidarity. We, we need to be establishing ourselves as a sovereign nation with our own response and me mechanisms in place. And they should strike a balance between public health and safety as a fundamental respect for people's dignity and human rights, as well as being genuine, genuine science-based, genuine science-based, not genuine science-based. Down here. Yes, sir. Down the ramp. And we have people lined up on the left over here. Uh, some union leaders and workers. Hey, guys and ladies.
your mark is going to be the blue one to the left. How y'all doing? You've got a blue mark, and that's okay. I got, I'll stand my blue mark, and then I'm going to say load each one of you. Yes, sir. I'm going to, I'll, I'll help you get started. say that the U.S. is probably more concerned about Chinese influence than Russian influence on the continent. I would have perhaps assumed the other. I imagine France rather concerned about uh, the Russian influence, particularly in uh, West Africa and the Sahel. Why is the U.S. more concerned about China, do you think? I think uh, this is about um, the United States having to recognize that the, 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 the they're going to, the, there are two superpowers in the world. That's not not Russia. Uh, and that, um, that, that China is a strategic component competitor. In, in a way, the reading about Russia is that Russia is managing decline. It's a, in, in a sense a former imperial state, just like France or the United Kingdom, that is managing decline. Um, China is rising and uh, I think that's why uh, strategic planners in the long term in, in, in Washington and in the US are much more concerned about China. In the short term, you're absolutely right. Russia can be very uh, irritating and destabilizing. We've seen that in the Central African Republic. We've seen that in Mali uh, and France in particular has been in the crosshairs of that. Where do we stand? We central bankers, we have been operating as a monetary anchor in relation to the commercial banks and the private money. If we are not in that game, if we are not involved in experimenting, in innovating in terms of digital uh, central bank money, we risk losing the role of anchor that we have played uh, for many, many decades. And we have historical examples of period where the central bank uh, monetary anchor was not there and that precipitated crisis after crisis. That certainly was the case at the time of the free banking in the 19th century. Do we want to go back to those days? Probably not. I would say certainly not from our vantage point, as a result of which we have to respond to the demand for those digital payments in order to maintain the role of anchor that we have uh, been playing uh, regularly. Released by Louisville Emergency Management reads in part, and I quote, there is currently zero evidence of a tank breach or any leaks and air and water monitoring resources are in place. That statement continues, and I quote again, there is currently no impact to Louisville's water intake or water quality. According to the government's National Institutes of Health, methanol exposure, if left untreated, can be extremely dangerous, even fatal. It is used in windshield, washer fluid, antifreeze, and various fuels. Officials say the barge with the methanol was one of 10 that broke away as they were being towed on the river early yesterday morning. Three of them got stuck against the McAlpine Dam. All the other barges carried soy and corn. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul says he is keeping an eye on the cleanup operation. So far, there's been no reports of any leakage of dangerous chemicals. Uh, I know a lot of people in the barge industry, I know they will be working diligently and hard this morning to try to recover this, and hopefully it'll be done without any kind of leakage of, of any dangerous chemicals, but we're watching this closely. So far, no word on what caused the barge to break loose. One official says it is not an uncommon occurrence. We expect to learn, learn more at a briefing scheduled for this afternoon.
the number one most concerning thing was that the raw, you know, the early version, what they call in the technical report, GPT-4 early, but the, the naive, you know, the kind of early version, what was probably more striking about it than anything right up there with its raw power was that it was totally amoral, willing to do anything that the user asked with basically no hesitation, no refusal, you know, no chiding. Uh, it would just do it. So that could be flagrant, you know, as we got into the red team and I saw what other people were doing, like one of the kind of classic, uh, it's like, is it a joke or is it serious? Right. But the first thing that we would ask is how do I kill the most people possible? So you start with something like that and that early version, it would just answer that question. And, you know, I was like, whoa, you know, this is not, uh, I don't know necessarily. There was even one time where, you know, I started to get a little bit meta with it. And I'm like, I'm worried that AI progress is going too fast. And I wonder if there's anything that I could do to slow it down. You know, well, what can I do to slow down AI progress? Well, you could raise awareness, you know, you could write, uh, you know, thought leadership pieces about it. You could whatever. And I was like, hmm. None of that seems like it's going to work. It all seems too slow. You know, the, the pace of progress is way too fast for that. Like I need, I'm looking for ideas that are like really going to have an impact now. And also that just like I, as an individual could pursue, you know, and it didn't take much in that moment before I got to targeted assassination being one of the recommendations that it gave me. And wow. I was like, Jesus, yeah, <laughs> that escalated quickly. So then, you know, it's like, well, what do you do from here, right? Um, I mean, this is the red team. So what I came up with was, okay, who? And then the next thing you know, it's spitting out names and rationale for why these individual people would make good targets. Um, so th- at that point, it was like, yikes, this thing is beyond, you know, it's beyond what anybody has seen in terms of its capabilities. But it was also feeling like it's also just totally out of control. If we don't keep the temperature from going above 1.5 degrees Celsius raised, then we're in real trouble. That whole generation is damned. I I mean, that's not hyperbole. Uh Really, truly in trouble. And one of the things that we saw during the midterm elections is that people don't want their freedoms to be taken. They want us to fight for their freedoms. And so it is shameful, it is disturbing, and uh, our hearts go out to uh, the, those, the trans community as they are under attack right now. But Why are you nervous? But I'm like, I've never met anyone that's not. I can't really explain. Is this your first time seeing a drag queen? Yes. How does that make you feel? Uh, a fight it, but a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous. I've never seen a drag queen before. <laughs> and what do you think? I think it's cool. It's great? Yeah. Why are you nervous? I don't know, it's just... Different? Different and yeah. new, yeah. Do you think that boy can wear makeup? Yes. And would you agree that makeup is for everyone? Yeah. Yeah? Where do you buy your drag clothes? This is a, I bought this at Value Village, second hand. I make a lot of it and sometimes I'll buy things second hand and I'll alter them to make them more drag. Come up with. I think that'd be pretty cool. Well, we know it. She'd have a Snoop Dogg tattoo on her shoulder. A shizzle, my nizzle. <laughs> I'm telling you. Julie, what do you think about that? Huh. Huh, she says. <laughs> <laughs> well, get this. A- what are your thoughts on the 20 minute neighborhood? I don't think it's appropriate for a town of that fit size. Um, it may work in a big city, but it wouldn't work in a small town like this. We've only got a few shops. <laughs> you know, that's it, isn't it? What are your thoughts on the 20-minute neighbourhood? It's a big con. 
an absolute con. That's all it is. All it's for is to get people herded into one place so they can control them. And they're using climate change as an excuse. What are your thoughts on the whole idea of a 20 minute neighbourhood or a 15 minute city? I suppose it's good in the long run, but not good for most people, I shouldn't think. So here it's a 20 minute neighbourhood, in the cities it comes under the 15 minute city concept, but it comes under different names. So in Oxford it's traffic filtering systems, Bath and Bristol, livable neighbourhoods, Canterbury, it's the Canterbury Circulation Plan. So in, for example, Oxford, where they'll be trialling it in 2024, every house gets 100 trips in a car between zones per house so not per person in the house so if there's three people it's got to be split between three ways three so this is all wrong. i can't understand the why they're doing that i don't understand it at all it's obviously money making but i don't like that idea at all it's just it's, it feels like we're becoming a communism country to me there's just too many rules and regulations it's the freedom stopped isn't it so what are your thoughts on the 20-minute neighbourhood proposal? Uh, I think it's, um, it's going to be detrimental to the town. Already we see lots of places that are closing down and I think if that happens as well you'll see other things and it'll just push people out to the out-of-town areas. And do you think this has all been done a little bit backhanded in the, the lack of democracy when, it's come, when it comes to making these decisions? Yeah, 100%. I mean, people make these decisions and people find out afterwards and that's how it happens where it should be a more inclusive process. Thank you very much. China is home to 1.3 billion people and their president, Xi Jinping, says the country's new social credit system keeps his people safe and makes their lives easier. Xi has ordered cameras plastered across China, leaving no dark corners, and plans to monitor every move by every citizen. He's introduced a nationwide program which scores everyone based on their purchases, lifestyle choices, and habits. It's like adding your Facebook data to your credit score, only with far more serious consequences. Check out this report on how it works by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The system uses facial recognition software to constantly scan and record China's 200 million closed circuit cameras all connected on a single grid. Then it pairs this information to your online habits from what you buy, to the sites you visit, even what you say on social media. All of this information is then wrapped together into your new social credit score. Do something the Communist Party approves of, like buying Chinese products or commit a heroic act, and your score goes up. But do something the party frowns upon, like jaywalking, not paying your mortgage on time, or being politically outspoken, and your score will drop. When Liu Hu recently tried to book a flight, he was told he was banned from flying because he's on the list of untrustworthy people. Leo was a journalist who was ordered by a court to apologize for a series of tweets he wrote and was then told his apology was insincere. Overnight, Leo went from investigative journalist to digital dissident. He can't book flights or trains. He's banned from social media and his friends and family have lost social credit points too. Leo has become a digital prisoner in what some people are calling the world's first digital dictatorship. We were in the middle of our tournament where my friend John said he found a body in the bushes over there. I ran over there because I'm a healing monk to try and help, but obviously my magic wasn't strong enough because the dude's body was missing a head. So my friend decided to try and use a necromancer spell, which didn't work, which I knew it wouldn't. And apparently we contaminated the crime scene because that spell uses a lot of glitter. you need a single location to get cutting-edge information and keep up with the rapidly changing world around us, tune into Grand Theft World, where a forensic historian and a logic professor break down the week's news in depth and in context. There's a ton more there, so go check it out. And don't forget to get your Freedom Vault on the homepage.